Can we pension, please? Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to have Dolev Blobstein from Harvard University join us for the physics colloquium today. Uh, Dolev did his undergraduate studies at UC Santa Barbara, where he did research with Anya Jayich uh, before moving on to Harvard University to join the group of Misha Lukin, where he's been involved in a wide range of studies uh, in quantum information processing using atom arrays, some of which you'll hear about today. Uh, we So Dolev is currently a graduate student in Misha Lukin's group. Uh, we don't invite a lot of graduate students to the physics, to give the physics colloquium, but I think for reasons that you'll see very shortly, we just couldn't wait to invite him uh, to tell us about the research that he's been doing at Harvard. So Dolev, please take it away. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And let me know if there's any challenge with hearing me. So, um, uh, I, and Dean, I'll tell you about some of the experiments from my PhD. And uh, broadly, this is taking place in this larger field of quantum science and technology, where we are trying to leverage basic quantum mechanical principles like superposition and entanglement for new applications uh, in both science and technology. And a classic example is that of quantum computation. And in classical computers, we have bits, and we do operations on bits. Uh, like zero and one, and this is how we do computation. With quantum computers, we have qubits that can be zero, one, and zero and one at the same time, and then we do operations on qubits. And broadly, n qubits can be in principle in two to the n different states at the same time. And if you're very clever, you can leverage uh, this uh, exponentially uh, large space in order to get an exponential computational power to study new types of quantum phenomena as well as new types of computational algorithms. And there is a lot of work in trying to figure out what exactly can we use quantum computers for. But I am a physicist, and in my view, they're very clearly very good at one particular aspect, which is simulating quantum mechanics. And in my view, and I don't know if this is a controversial statement, but quantum physics is one of the most surprising things that humans have potentially ever found. And it would be very useful to have a tool that can simulate it very precisely. And uh, this has broad ranging implications in physics from you know, high energy, to condensed matter, to quantum chemistry. And um, while we're broadly exploring what quantum computers can be useful for, and it is you know, a challenging question, the one tool, uh, the one application that I personally find extremely exciting is using them as tools for, semi, uh, for, for studying quantum mechanics. And I think that this will continue to have uh, uh, broad ranging implications uh, in the future. So uh, in terms of some of the modern frontiers of experimental quantum information, in the past decade, it has been quite an exciting time where we've been able to start exploring um, uh, uh, kind of small scale computations. Small scale quantum computations uh, with physical qubits. And when I say physical qubits, I'm imagining some type of two level system like atoms, ions, or superconductors. Uh, and we've recently gained so much control over these that we can start to really use them as discovery tools. And we've started to poke and prod these systems where we have many interacting qubits and can start to study very different types of interesting phenomena that come out, sometimes in regimes that we can't even simulate classically. And they've already started to elucidate different interesting aspects of quantum physics that we're able to now study in the lab. And this has been one very exciting frontier recently. Uh, another very exciting frontier has been starting to take these multiple physical qubits, which might be quite noisy, and then combine them into what we call a logical qubit, which is this robust qubit that we build with entanglement that in principle can actually perform much, much better than the underlying physical components that make these. And this is something that's been going on in the field really only in the past you know, one or two years. So um, uh, these are two pretty exciting frontiers in experimental quantum information. And broadly, we would like to use quantum mechanics for computation and for simulating quantum systems. And in one way or another, the central challenge that we have to face is that of decoherence. Finding decoherence is really a central challenge in using quantum systems for simulating uh, other quantum systems and generally for doing computation. And quantum error correction in one form or another is the only known realistic route that we have in order to suppress the operation errors or the gate errors from what our physical qubits have on the scale of you know, 10 to minus three to what we need for doing a whole host of a variety of interesting quantum algorithms that you know, require operation errors at the scale of 10 to minus 10. And this is, in fact, so dramatic that before quantum error correction was invented, people thought quantum computing would just be fundamentally impossible. And there's many good reasons to believe that it would be, because quantum information is fundamentally very different than classical information. It's fundamentally much harder to store and operate on. And if we were to imagine, for example, that I have some classical bit, 
some classical bit zero, and I put it you know, on this table. We can all take pictures of it and then agree that it's in the state zero. And in a sense, through interaction with the environment, this classical bit becomes stabilized. It gets copied in more places. But we know that this is not what happens when we have a quantum bit. When we have a quantum bit in some state psi, and then we measure it and take pictures of it, it'll probabilistically jump into qubit state zero or qubit state one, and it'll collapse the wave function and cause decoherence. This is already one central way in which quantum information is very different than classical information. It's intrinsically destabilized by interaction with this environment. Uh, and another kind of you know, key challenge is imagine that you're trying to do some type of quantum computation, for example, with a chain of spins, and these spins here are your two-level system that are forming your quantum computer. And you might very precisely tune all the interactions between the spins in order to produce some quantum computation output that solves some problem you're interested in. But what happens if you're just off by a little bit and you have some epsilon error on all of the interactions that you very precisely tuned? Then now all of your spins are going to chaotically go into a very different state, not the one that you intended. And it's something that you know, you're very sensitive to. And you're very, very sensitive to these small, for example, uh, miscalibration errors or small um, rotation errors. And this is you know, not unique to quantum systems necessarily. And so this is, you know, there's a very deep reason that we use digital classical computers that are built out of bits, you know, zeros and ones, and not analog classical computers, at least predominantly, which you know, are, can represent real numbers and are and potentially very powerful, uh, but you know, are very hard to correct errors because you know, they're not discretized. And this is also a challenge when we think about, well, if I were trying to do a computation with a chain of spins, then I'm going to be very sensitive to these continuous or analog rotations uh, that are going to be intrinsically sensitive to imperfections. Uh, so we need some way, if we're going to try to use quantum mechanics for computation, we definitely need some way in order to be able to correct errors. And quantum error correction is a quite remarkable concept uh, that was invented, uh, you know, including by people here. So, um, which is why I'm slightly nervous. <laughs> so, so uh, classical error correction, um, uh, you know, utilizes a simple concept, which is that you can just copy information. You can copy classical information. And so you might take a bit zero, for example, that you want to protect and copy it three times. And now if one of the bits fails, you can detect that it failed by you know, measuring all of the bits and doing the majority voting and then returning back to your original state. But quantum error correction comes with a whole variety of conceptual challenges. One is that we can't copy quantum information. So this already seems like a major showstopper. We can't you know, copy a qubit psi into three you know, copies of psi. Another conceptual issue is that on the previous slide, we discussed how when you measure a quantum bit, you collapse it. So how are you even going to check for errors without disturbing the underlying state. And remarkably, it is possible to do quantum error correction, but it's using a very different physical mechanism. What you do is you use entanglement, one of these core principles of quantum mechanics that we want to explore in this field of quantum science and technology. You use entanglement in order to store information non-locally. You take some logical qubit degree of freedom that you care about, and now you spread it out across many individual physical qubits. This is one instantiation. Of course, there's many different types of quantum error correction um, uh, that can also be considered. But what you do now is you take this logical qubit and then you hide it. You delocalize it over many individual physical qubits through entanglement. And now if the environment were to come in and measure just a single one, it actually will learn nothing about the underlying state that you stored. And that is the core principle for how you can keep this one quantum bit safe. Um, and uh, also remarkably, it turns out that you can infer the errors that happened without corrupting the underlying state of this logical qubit, not by measuring individual qubits, which doesn't work for the reason we discussed, but by measuring products of qubits. And these products of qubits are these stabilizer checks. And these checks that we'll talk about in a second detect errors, but while still preserving the encoded quantum information. And this is quite remarkable theoretically. And I think that's well captured by this famous argument between Peter Schwartz and uh, Landauer, where Landauer was, you know, protesting some of these recent ideas in quantum computation, describing that, you know, we already know about analog computation. This just seems like analog computation. You know, what you just reinvented this. And we know that this doesn't work uh, because you can't correct errors. And Peter's response is that although the computation is analog, the errors are digital. And this is something that I think really gets at core, you know, physical mechanisms of quantum mechanics, whereas that you can do quantum computations in the wave-like mode of a quantum system, but when you measure it, because of the you know, important role of projective measurement, you get particle-like behavior that discretizes your errors and actually allows you to correct them. And what I hope to also indicate in today's talk is that error correction is very exciting, both because it's going to allow us ideally to do you know, complex computations in the near term, 
Uh, but also because I think it's an extremely interesting scientific frontier and it also gives us new ways and new lenses for looking at quantum mechanics and allows us to interact with really core principles such as these. So, okay, this is the slide I'm most nervous for. We'll take a look to the water. <laughs> so, a classic example of this is uh, this Kitayev Torku. Um, and um, uh, um, this is a, you know, a paradigmatic example of quantum error correction. And what this looks like is we have qubits here on a 2D lattice with periodic boundaries. And the error free state is the state where all of these stabilizer products or checks are simultaneously equal to plus one. And these checks here are given by four body products of X on plaquettes and Zs on stars of this lattice. And it turns out that in this error free state, you can just read out the logical qubit to degree of freedom by looking at strings. Of course, very interesting and intimate connections to condensed matter physics. Where you can read out this, you know, uh, logical encoded state by looking at this vertical and horizontally propagating strings on this lattice. And what an example error correction looks like is that you might measure your checks, and without revealing the underlying physical qubit states because you're only measuring their products, you might see that these two checks both have a minus one flag law. And from this minus one flag law enough, you can probably infer well, probably I had an error on this physical qubit here that corrupted two of my checks, but didn't corrupt all the rest of the checks. And through this inference process, which we call decoding. You can now undo this change either by physically returning the qubit in its hardware or just keeping track of it. And as you increase the size of your lattice or your code distance D, you get more opportunities for errors, but you also get more checks. And this leads to a threshold behavior where the logical error probability of your code can, in principle, be exponentially suppressed if you get below a characteristic threshold in the system. And this characteristic threshold is actually quite favorable. It's at the scale of roughly 1%. So if you can reduce your physical errors to the scale of you know, roughly 10 to the minus 3, and now you can make several hundred qubits in this um, uh, uh, Tor code here, you now get a really realistic route to getting toward extremely small errors by leveraging the exponential suppression of this logical error. And it was really this theoretical breakthrough of quantum error correction that really allowed the field of quantum computing to take off. And all we've learned a tremendous amount from experimenting with physical qubits in the lab and doing small scale quantum algorithms and exploring quantum simulation with physical qubits, it has been understood that we will eventually need to switch to performing our algorithms with logical qubits instead of with physical qubits. Uh, but that being said, there are significant challenges to quantum error correction. This does, in principle, give us a route to getting to extremely small errors and, and getting to you know, large scale computation. But when we think about the estimates of what are required for large scale problems, we often are imagining things like millions of physical qubits getting us the logical errors on the scale of 10 to the minus 10. And this is a lot of qubits that you need to control. Uh, but it's so far in the field been greatly further compounded by the challenge of how to control these systems. And so far, efficient classical control has been a major challenge, where in classical computers, something that we've gotten very good at doing is taking something at the scale of you know, thousands of wires in order to control billions of bits inside of a processor. And with the quantum systems that we've built so far, They've actually been built mostly you know, qubit by qubit, adding more and more connections and more and more wires for each qubit you're trying to control. And this has so far posed a major challenge to greatly increasing the scale of these systems. So one central challenge so far in studying error corrective computation in the lab has been the so-called wire problem, which has been posing a significant challenge to large scale control. Another key challenge is that once this logical qubit becomes delocalized, it also becomes really hard for us to do operations on it. It becomes hidden from the environment, but unfortunately, it also becomes protected from doing operations with other logical qubits. And the combination of the large overheads, along with the complexity of doing operations on logical qubits, have so far, you know, up until roughly this year, across many different um, systems, focused studies to doing you know, one or two logical qubits and dates. Um, and what I will tell you about today is approaches that we've taken recently in order to study quantum computation and quantum error correction using this method that we call the reconfigurable atom race. And we, what this system looks like is we have neutral atoms, and these neutral atoms are going to be our qubit. And we store them inside of optical tweezers. These are rubidium atoms. Inside of this optical tweezer, this rubidium atom has a very long coherence time. It's essentially an electron spin inside of it's a hyperfine state inside of this uh, atom. It has coherence times at the scale of seconds. And then when we want to entangle two atoms, what we do is we pulse a global laser pulse that excites these atoms to these highly excited Rydberg states that are high line orbital quantum states of the atom. And this causes them to entangle. We very briefly zap them to these high-line Rydberg states. They entangle, then we store them back down in this hyperfine qubit. And the coherence is, in fact, so long that we can actually move atoms around in the middle of our computation without losing that much coherence. 
And this has been able to, this has enabled us uh, to have two very, very important technical aspects that are going to be the centerpiece of today's talk uh, from a technical perspective, which is that it gives us non-local connectivity. And it turns out that for error correction, this is extremely useful. And secondly, the one that I cannot possibly emphasize enough is that it gives us the ability to do parallel and efficient possible control. Let me take a quick pause. Also, I think there's there's questions throughout, right? There's uh, one. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you make this very excited state and it always goes to one, either by a sequence of, there's no intermediate long-lived state that it might go to that could cause a problem. So it's, a, it's true that there's many different errors that can happen when we go through this river state. The river state is actually quite long-lived. It lives for roughly 200 microseconds. The gate takes roughly 200 nanoseconds. And so that corresponds to roughly 0.1% probability of making an error. And it's true that when you make that error, you can land in a variety of different states, but all of these we know how to handle. Yeah. Okay, please interrupt with uh, questions whenever. Okay, great. Okay, so in today's talk, I am going to tell you about three things. So first, I'm gonna tell you about how we program quantum circuits with neutral atoms. Then I'll tell you about some of our experiments studying error-corrected quantum algorithms. And uh, finally, I'll tell you about some new results uh, giving you know, new tools for understanding uh, ways to control neutral atoms, as well as new opportunities in quantum error correction. Okay, so first I'll tell you about programming circuits with atoms. And this is how uh, all of our experiments start. It starts with a cold gas of rubidium atoms trapped inside of our vacuum chamber. Um, and uh, the reason I really like to show this image is because this is how every experiment starts. There's already 10 million atoms right there. And it really leaves an impression on you that the atoms are really unlimited. There's really an unlimited resource of cold identical neutral atoms. The key challenge is how to then go and control them all in an efficient uh, in an efficient way. And it really pinpoints the key issue is efficient classical control. And um, what we do in our lab, uh, and that's kind of big, this concept of doing efficient classical control is baked into the experiment from the very beginning. We, for example, want to trap you know, thousands of atoms. And here we're trapping roughly a thousand atoms. And what we do is we take a single laser beam and shine it on the so-called spatial light modulator. That's one jargon word. It's an optical device that takes this one laser beam and then splits it into many programmable individual laser beams that then gets shown into our vacuum chamber. And then each uh, tweezer captures an atom with roughly 50% probability from our cold gas of rubidium atoms. And this is a, a real fluorescence image of the atoms. Then we stochastically load uh, the atoms into this tweezer array. And then what we do is we add another set of tweezers into the system. This is another jargon word. Is we use an acoustic optic deflector and what this acoustic optic deflector allows us to do is that it creates also programmable grids of light, but that can be quickly dynamically steered in real time, only using two voltage waveforms. It's something that's really important from a technical perspective. And just by using two voltage waveforms and using parallelism of this you know, optical beams, we then take these beams of light and then steer them here into this defect-free grid and sort this 1,000 atoms into a 400-atom defect-free configuration, for example. And we can make square grids. We can also make many different types of configurations so when Harry was in the lab, we made lots of different fun movies. Uh, we've been slacking on some of our fun movies recently. Uh, but uh, so, you know, this is, you know, just shows you the extreme programmability over um, atomic position that you have just by using these really simple optical tools. Uh, and that's, you know, how we lay out our, our processor. Okay, let me take another glass of water. Uh, so, um, yeah, please. Let's say 400 atoms. Yeah. Is that hard in your experiment? Because yes, yeah. So it's very challenging for many reasons. So one of the key, one of the ones is control. How do you control such large systems? And hopefully, with what I'll show you in today's talk, it'll make it clear that there are ways that we can take dramatic shortcuts to that. Another is laser power. It's a really important technical limitation. So in Manuel's group, they've been able to trap as many as six thousand atoms. But okay, now you also have to control them. But then also, I said in the beginning of the talk, we need millions. So that is really, you're pinpointing exactly the right question, and I'll maybe touch on that in a minute. Yeah. Okay, any other? Okay, thanks. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, that's how we lay out our system uh, by arranging these atoms inside of optical tweezers. Now we want to get them to entangle, and we again really want to leverage these ideas of parallelism and efficient classical control. And so, again, as mentioned earlier, we zap these atoms with a very finely tuned laser frequency, and it excites them to not, you know, n equals one, two, three, excuse me, orbital states, but up to n equals 50 or 70, you know, really high-lying orbital states of this atom. Uh, and 
uh, these are the so-called rubric states. And what's so interesting about this is if we put two atoms next to each other and we simultaneously try to excite both of them, then they'll both simultaneously get try to get excited into the rubric state, but they both can't go. They can't both go because of the so-called rubric blockade mechanism, where there's a very large energy penalty if two atoms are simultaneously in the rubric state. And so what this looks like is if you have two atoms next to each other in the ground state and you pulse on this Rydberg laser, then they'll both simultaneously try to get into the Rydberg state and they'll compete and go into you know, a symmetric entangled state of Rydberg ground plus ground Rydberg. And this generates entanglement just using this simple global laser pulse. And we've used this in our lab uh, for studying a variety of you know, analog quantum simulations where we study some type of Hamiltonian evolution, which works in quite a simple way. We then just arrange our atoms in some configuration, like a square lattice, as was shown in the previous uh, uh, slide, or like a Mario lattice. Uh, and then we turn on our global excitation laser, and then this just runs the Hamiltonian evolution of the system. And, and the system just interacts under these blockade dynamics. And here, for example, we were able to study things like chaotic or non-chaotic uh, quantum uh, systems and you know, various different types of quantum dynamics. We've also studied things like phase transitions, spin liquids, combinatorial optimization, all using you know, just positioning with the atoms and then global laser pulses. And uh, so this is you know, for studying Hamiltonian evolution. We want to do digital operations, as mentioned earlier, in order to be able to do error correction. And uh, when we do things digitally, we now have some quantum circuit. And this quantum circuit is decomposed into you know, qubits, which are here at each individual line, as well as gates, these you know, fundamental building blocks, like a single qubit gate, which creates superpositions, or a two qubit gate, which generates entanglement. And we want to now be able to realize these controllable quantum operations in order to, in principle, do universal quantum computation. But although there's many more degrees of freedom in the system, we still really want to be able to keep this efficient classical control. Okay? And so the way that we're doing this is we actually move the atoms around in the computation, as mentioned earlier, and we're again leveraging these highly parallel global Rydberg laser pulses. So here we made a Tor code on a torus um, uh, a few years ago, and here this movie, so it's a real movie of our atoms, it's you know, slowed down you know, by many factors, this is not the real speed that this uh, thing moves at. Um, but the, uh, I received a comment recently that part of the concern of clock speed with these systems is that people thought that this, some of these movies are at real time, which I would understand the concern. <laughs> so, um, okay. But then, so we have here um, a grid of 16 data qubits fixed in SLM tweezers. And this, uh, these tweezers allow us to put atoms anywhere in space. And then we have eight ancilla atoms that are rocketing around the system in this AOD tweezers. And every time we put the atoms into a new pair, we pulse our global river laser and they entangle. And that's how we program our quantum circuits here. So again, the two really salient features is that we have global pulses and we have this phenomenon of blockade. And that, what this means is we just put two atoms next to each other and pulse this global laser. If two atoms are next to each other, they'll entangle and that's how we can program quantum circuits. And now the circuit is simply programmed by these you know, efficient optical tools that allow us to do something like program a Mario movie, but now we can use them to program quantum circuits. Okay. Take a quick Water. Please interrupt with any questions. What about single qubit gates? Sorry? What about single qubit gates? Great. So I did not mention it here, but we have beams that come out through our objective. And what we do is it's a microwave transition. And we take the microwaves and we infuse them into the light through amplitude, amplitude modulating our laser beam. And then we take this amplitude modulated laser beam and then shine it at individual atoms. So either at individual atoms or something I you know, skipped over, then we can also shine a grid of laser beams to address a whole grid of atoms. And that's going to be important in a second. Great question. So uh, that's how we program quantum circuits. And in particular, this is extremely well suited to doing error corrected processing, where, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we really would like to understand how to do com computation on logical qubits. And um, once we started you know, envisioning, well, let's say we had an array of surface codes or toric codes, and we want to do computation on them then now you should really not be thinking about this control problem in terms of how to do arbitrary single physical qubit control. We should really be thinking about how to do arbitrary single logical qubit control. And in particular, if you were to imagine we have a surface code grid, you know, this one big logical qubit, and we want to do a gate on it, it turns out that a lot of the gates that we're interested in, we can do them in this way that we call transversal. And what this means is to do this gate on the logical level, all you have to do is just take one big beam and illuminate that exact same operation on all of the physical qubits that make up this one, you know, effectively big atom that's making up this big logical qubit. And that's how we can do single qubit gates. To do two qubit gates, we can also do this in a very efficient way, where we just pick up these grids, 
interlace them with each other, very similar to the you know previous slide. Excuse me. Pulsar one global pulse of the river entangled laser, and then we get pairwise entanglement between all of the individual uh, physical qubits of the two corresponding blocks, and this allows us to do an entangling in a way which is transversal. And if you look at some of these, you know, early papers um, on quantum error pressure, there's this funny comment from Shore in this paper that describes these transversal operations, describing how this is easily accomplished because it's a bitwise operation. Of course, he did not mean from an experimental perspective, but this is also in practice true from an experimental perspective. Okay. So, um, and that was allowing us to start studying efficient and parallel computation, uh, but with logical qubits. And I really want to emphasize this transversal CNOT point, which is... Someone say something? No? Nope. Okay, sorry. So the um, so this transversal entangling gate is something that's really central, this transversal C0, which is that earlier I said that the way that our quantum computation works, or our quantum error correction works, is we take a logical qubit and then we hide it by delocalizing it across many individual physical qubits. But now if we have two of them right next to each other and we're trying to interact them through a boundary, it's actually very challenging because they're both delocalized independently. But if we can move the atoms and we can just put them right on top of each other, then it turns out that we can do this when we do this transversal gate. We just directly interact these underlying degrees of freedom while they're still protected by just doing this one simple blow with the global pulse of our river laser. And there's many benefits of this approach. So one that I'll touch about, you know, briefly at the toward the end of the talk, but then I'll also talk about extensively in the IQIM seminar tomorrow, is that it allows this. It turns out that it allows us to dramatically reduce the total amount of error correction that we have to do. So it allows us to greatly reduce the number of stabilizer measurements that we have to do per uh, logic operation. From an algorithmic perspective, it also starts to give us long range and direct connections between logical qubits, and this can have significant savings for large scale algorithms. And finally, from an experimental perspective, the thing that I cannot possibly emphasize enough is it gives us this really core aspect of efficient classical control. Because all these physical qubits just now in this one big block act like one effectively big atom, and we can address it with just you know, this one big laser beam. And we can greatly simplify this control problem. And uh, leveraging these techniques, we've um, uh, started doing experiments here with what I would call our first generation logical um, uh, processor, where we also have segmented the system into multiple so-called zones, where we have a storage zone, an entangling zone, a readout zone. The atoms can be stored for very long times in the storage zone uh, uh, due to their long coherence time. If we want to pick up two logical qubits and entangle them on demand, <laughs> we just pick up two uh, grids move them into the entangling zone, pulse our one global laser pulse, and in this way, uh, entangle them in a single step. And we can also take these logical qubits and move them far away from the other atoms, and then measure them in the middle of the computation by shooting laser light at them and collecting it on camera. And as some examples of what this looks like, here we made a so-called Schrodinger cat state, or you know, 000 plus 111 GHG state of these atoms. And this movie shows, so this again, a real atom movie, um, uh, but not at real time. So, okay, let me go back. So, okay, in the first three steps, so one, two, three, we prepare these so called color code logical qubits. Then, here, we do transversal C knots between you know, whole grids of them, and that fault tolerantly prepares one of our uh, a sets of logical qubits. And now we get these you know, high fidelity logical qubits that we then use for programming this quantum circuit by just sliding around these blocks and acting on them as if they're just this one big atom. Uh, so this is an example of how we do this, um, for example, make the GHG state, uh, but we can also study things like entangling operations between these logical qubits and how well they perform. And um, uh, uh, here what we do is we prepare two copies of surface codes by doing a single round of stabilizer measurements. Then we uh, move our ancillas away to the side, do our transversal entangling gate between these surface codes, and again, as mentioned earlier, a really important property of quantum error correction is that we really want to see that operations improve as we increase the size of the code. And here we study this going from distance three to distance five to distance seven. And um, uh, we see that as we increase the size of the code, the error on this bell pair that we create goes down. It goes down very slowly. It goes down only by you know, 20% every time we increase the code distance. Um, in tomorrow's IQIM seminar, I'll highlight new results where we're able to do this much better now. Um, but the... Uh, uh, but it starts to show that you're able to, you know, improve an operation by increasing the size of the code. And um, uh, another really important aspect here is we're using this technique that we call correlated decoding, which allows us to, you know, greatly improve the way that we study certain types of algorithms. And in print, and, and actually, what we've learned from doing these experiments and really inspired by experiments is that this implemented protocol that we've done here not only allows us to do only a single round of stabilizer measurement for this particular experiment, 
but allows us to actually get away with doing universal computation with logical qubits with only you know one round of stabilizer measurement per gate as opposed to the conventional D rounds. And that greatly reduces the overall time overhead of doing large scale computation. Um, so here we're studying how we can improve entangling operations by increasing the size of our code. Um, but we would like to do, you know, more interesting types of, you know, for example, quantum simulations with our logical qubits. And something that's a major challenge is that error correcting codes are not as tunable as the physical qubits that we're used to. And we would really like to study, you know, in a kind of code design fashion, how we can leverage particular types of error correcting codes for studying particular types of algorithms. And here's something that's quite funny about these quantum error correction codes is that we only get these discrete gates that's available to us. We can only do discrete gates like a Hadamard or an S gate or a C naught. And this is on its face, a, you know, kind of a significant challenge because for 2D codes like the surface code, it turns out that we can only do the so-called Clifford gates, but we really need non-Cliffords in order to be able to do things that are, you know, interesting and like classically complex and hard to simulate. And it's a very upside down world than what we're used to with physical qubits. With physical qubits, what your experimentalist friends are used to telling you, is they can do any you know, arbitrary single qubit rotation on this physical qubit, but entanglement is very hard. But with logical qubits, it's actually a completely upside down world where continuous rotations are actually the hardest thing to do, but entanglement is very easy. And uh, motivated by this, here we're studying quantum simulations where we're going to try to you know, build some interesting type of quantum simulation, but out of discrete digital building blocks and see if we can simulate some things more precisely in this way. Uh, so we have here, I won't get into the details, but we made 3D error correcting codes. It's you know, very similar to the 2D error correcting codes that we discussed earlier, but they gain more types of operations that we're able to do. They gain the ability to natively do these so-called non-clifford operations. And here what we do is we make many of them, we make 48 of them, and we start to entangle them on hypercube, but doing very complex uh, non-clifford gates and uh, studying how we can scramble information rapidly and get rapid entanglement growth in the system. There's interesting links to things like black hole dynamics in terms of fast scramblers. And what we study here is the samples that come out of our system. And what that means is we make our you know, wave function and then we take pictures of this wave function and then compare it to our expected simulations. And what we see is that we're able to do uh, a much better job and we're able to get a, a higher sampling score with our error correcting qubits than we're able to do with our physical qubits. And for this experiment in particular, we're actually, so not for the other experiments I described earlier, but for this experiment in particular, we're actually doing post-selection where we only accept some number, uh, some fraction of samples that satisfy a certain criteria, which is not ultimately scalable. But even here, we're able to get a higher score than we're able to otherwise get uh, uh, for this particular type of task, okay? And so, okay, so this sampling score here tells us about how well we can do this, excuse me, this fast scrambling dynamics uh, and how, how accurately we can do it. And um, zooming into the data, so here we're looking at just 12 logical qubits in the system uh, made out of these uh, small 3D error correcting codes. And uh, this plot shows you the entire buffer space of, um, you know, there's two to the 12 possible outcomes. And we make this wave function, and then again, we take pictures of it, and we compare our experimental distribution with that of the theoretical distribution. And what you can see is that, okay, the you know, fidelity isn't perfect. We're not perfectly overlapping these two distributions together. But you can also see that across this entire Hilbert space, everywhere that there's a theoretical peak, there's a little experimental peak that follows. And if you zoom in on this red arrow, for example, these two tiny little features here, then as you zoom in further and further, these two features here are these two big features down at the bottom. You can see that even down at the noise floor of you know, all of the different coefficients in this wave function, even though the fidelity is not well overlapped, or it's not perfectly well overlapped, you still reproduce the shape very well. And you're able to reproduce these tiny wiggles in the theoretical distribution. And I think this points to one of the things that's so remarkable about doing experiments with error correcting qubits, which is that they're very different than physical qubits. And this is not what we typically see when we do experiments with just our error atoms. And what you're doing here is you're taking these digital, you know, discrete building blocks that are error corrected, and you're building, you know, precise but complex many-body entanglement using that. And you can target specific states in Hilbert space, uh, but in a precise fashion. And you know, paralleling the discussion uh, you know, between Shore and Landauer, I think you can really see here things like that, although you can do analog type of computation, you get digital errors. And we can start to see some of these things that you know, initially for us in the lab, studying them was quite surprising. 
And this is something we're actually working on. I guess there's a lot of people from Catholic that we're collaborating on this one. Um, uh, and we can see that indeed, uh, you know, we um, uh, uh, the errors in our system are in, in our error correcting system, even though on the physical level we have many coherent errors, on the logical level we only have you know incoherent errors, like probabilistic fit flips, but not continuous over or under rotations. And we can use this for this sampling task, but we can also use it for a whole host of other interesting uh, experiments. So for example, here, what we do is we scramble the state by using these digital building blocks, but then we want to measure what scrambling we created. And so we measure the entanglement entropy in the system. The way this tells us you know, how entangled the state is. And we do this by making two copies of this quantum state and then measuring them in their bell basis by doing in uh, C naughts between all of the pairs of the two copies. And then what we're able to see is this very characteristic page curve where the entanglement entropy grows and grows and grows for this you know, highly scrambled state. But as you get to half the system size, the system starts to realize it's inside of a quantum simulator and the entanglement entropy starts to go down and the purity of the state starts to increase up until you get to the whole system and the purity uh, is you know, almost one, uh, which is not something that we've been able to do before with physical qubits, at least not to this level of precision, Again, because of you know this you know uh, high fidelity operation that you can realize with error correcting qubits, and I think it starts to pinpoint that even for this very first context and very simple uh, you know problems, um, we can already start to use these error correcting building blocks, even you know when they're very small, to do certain things much more precisely and study quantum simulations in a much more precise fashion uh, than we often do. And uh, this is a movie of what exactly this quantum circuit looks like. So we in the first three steps. So, okay, one, two, three, we create these 3D error correcting codes. And now we start to entangle them all on a hypercube. So we now take, pick up, you know, sequential bigger and bigger blocks of logical qubits and then entangle them all on a hypercube. We ran out of space here. So we moved some of our qubits into the storage zone while preserving their coherence. We bring a new patch, do this all over again. And uh, okay, this is a fun movie, but if there's anything that you're going to take away scientifically from this movie, is that if you wanted to realize this quantum circuit here, it really just fundamentally does not make sense to have an individual laser for each individual atom that you want to address. You really should have one big global laser to do this all in parallel. Okay, let me take a quick sip of water. Okay. So um, in terms of some observations, so uh, our first goal was to start doing error corrected algorithms in the lab. And we found various things. So one of the most central ones that I cannot possibly emphasize enough is the parallel control over logical qubit blocks. So this is you know, just a university lab experiment, frantically you know, operated by graduate students, and, sorry, and uh, of which I am one, so just to be also guilty. But then the, the um, but this is the type of circuits that we draw. These are the types of diagrams that we draw for ourselves in the lab when we're making this GHG state, for example, is we're not keeping track of a 70 physical qubit circuit, we're keeping track of a simple 10 logical qubit circuit, where when we want to realize you know, all these transversal gates between all these logical blocks in parallel, we just think about doing everything on the logical level. That was one really important experimental finding. Another one is the importance of considering algorithms as a whole. And this is you know, what allows us to greatly reduce the overheads, the time overheads of quantum computation. We also can study how we make, do particular quantum algorithms with particular error correcting codes. We see things like the fact that these errors get digitized. <laughs> And we can all. We also have been starting to transition our theory to being focused. Uh, our transition in in um, theory focusing algorithms to error correction and focusing our error correction to algorithms. And okay, so these were our first goals. Our second goal is to now improve the performance of our algorithms, of course, and also their scope. And here, a really central aspect is the we need to have we need to be able to use quantum error correction in order to be able to actually increase the depth of a quantum circuit. And of course, this can come with a whole variety of new and unexpected nuances. So to this end, um, so to touch back on what I was saying earlier, so uh, as mentioned, these transversal gates allow us to do logic operations directly between the data qubits um, by you know, pulsing this one global pulse of the laser. And this is actually kind of in contrast to the conventional way that at least in recent years, people have been thinking about doing quantum computation with error correcting qubits, where typically it's imagined that you do things on a lattice you know, for example, in a two-dimensional two configuration. And now, again, as mentioned earlier, if you have these 2D localized wave functions, it's very hard to get them to interact through this boundary. And so the way that you get them to interact is actually by doing many stabilizer measurements with these SLS. And 
Now, you know, this logic operations aren't realized directly between the data qubits. They're realized via the ancillas. And so it's really, really important to get these stabilizer measurements right. And for this reason, we have to repeat these stabilizer measurements d times, where d is, again, the size of our lattice, uh, in order to get certainty and you know, so-called fault tolerance. And the reason, again, is that the delocalized information needs to travel through the boundary. It's very different, however, with tra transversal context. We still do need to do stabilizer measurements, but it's for a very different reason. We do stabilizer measurement here not to do logic operations, but to remove errors, to remove entropy from the system. And so for this reason, measurement errors are quite benign. All they do is impact how well you can remove entropy. And you only need, you know, if you have a very, very large lattice, there's no reason that you would need to do many stabilizer measurements in order to remove this locally created entropy. You only need to do roughly one in order to remove, you know, this constant amount of entropy. And so with this correlated decoding technique that I described earlier, with transversal gates, we can actually do universal computation in this way with just order of one stabilizer measurement per operation. And, uh, okay, I'll talk more about this in the IQIM seminar tomorrow. Um, but the... Uh, um, so the mental model here for how this oh, some oh, okay yeah please interrupt the discussion. So the mental model for how this computation looks like is we have a algorithm that we're doing between logical qubits, you know, with transversal gates, and then you're doing stabilizer measurements. And we see here in numerics that you can greatly reduce the number of rounds of error correction that you have to do for entangling the operation, and for you know large system sizes that we often imagine for doing you know large scale error corrected computation where our code distance d needs to be quite large. It actually speeds up our computation by roughly a factor of 100. Uh, and this is very useful for speeding up our computation, but it does not change the fact that we still need to you know, do many stabilizer measurements in order to remove entropy from the system. And so here what we're studying is indeed this entropy removal uh, with doing repeated error correction. So um, what we have here is a very similar setup to what was described earlier, where we have an array of uh, 5 by 5 qubits making a distance 5 surface code inside of our entangling zone. And then we have here interlaced one ancilla block that's going to do one of our stabilizer measurements. We also have a storage and readout zone down here where we have other ancilla blocks that we're going to use for doing additional rounds of error correction. And what we see uh, is that, so what we're doing in particular here is we're injecting coherent errors into the system as we're doing this repeated error correction. And here we're only doing four rounds of error correction. Uh, but even then, with this repeated error correction, we're injecting these coherent errors. And what we see is that this repeated error correction is allow, allowing us to you know, greatly suppress the logical error in the system. So you know, in, uh, from top to bottom, increasing in the number of the rounds of error correction, which is decreasing our logical error probability. And we see in this context here, so okay, of course we want to do an algorithm where the entropy is created from the computation. Here, the entropy is created by injecting coherent errors. But okay, in the simple context, we're already able to see that we're able to greatly suppress error by doing repeated error correction. And it's coming from two very core physical mechanisms that touch upon what I said earlier in the talk. So one that I think is you know, quite remarkable, uh, although it's well understood, is this projected measurement effect. Again, coming back to the fact that we do analog computation, but the errors are digital. And so uh, here, we're actually not even looking at the ancilla values. So we're doing stabilizer measurement, but we don't even look at the ancilla values. And Still, the logical error is greatly suppressed by doing repeated error correction. And the reason for that is this quantum Zeno effect, where you have some state, and then you deviate slightly from it by doing some you know, global coherent error. But now, as you measure your stabilizers, you project back down into some state with, you know, um, with an error probability that goes to state of square. And so if you don't do repeated correction, the error builds and builds, and then you, you know, quickly go away from your target state. But if you do your repeated error correction, the data squared stays small, and from this quantum zero effect, you don't deviate from your intended logical state. Uh, and you know, what I think is so remarkable about this is it really gets to the fundamental core of why quantum error correction is possible, which is that you know, we get projective measurement. And then you could not do this with an array of you know, interacting magnets that you're trying to do some computation with because you don't have projective, me projective measurement. So that's one key mechanism. Another key mechanism is that as we do the stabilizer measurement, we're removing entropy from the system. And the way we're removing entropy is we have these ancillas. And OK, if we don't do repeated error correction, then as we increase the error rate, here we're plotting the entropy distribution in the processor measured by the probability that stabilizers are excited. And uh, here we have ancillas in our storage region. And they're staying cold because we're not applying errors to them. But then our errors are growing and growing on our data qubit array. And this leads to, you know, of course, an increased logical error. But then here, when we do this repeated error correction, 
we take some of this entropy and then we dump it into the Ancillus and move some of this entropy into our cold bath of Ancillus. And this allows us to remove the entropy on our data qubit array. And um, now by tracking the Ancilla values, you further suppress this you know, um, uh, error from doing these, you know, injecting these uh, coherent errors that's injecting entropy into the system. And uh, this is able to then you know, suppress logical error. But now we really need a way to remove entropy from the Ancillas, because we took, took out all this entropy from our data qubits into our Ancilla qubits. Now we can't use our Ancilla qubits anymore, because now they're hot. So now we need to do something about that. Let me take a quick sip of water. Any questions or comments or? Okay. So, okay, summarize one more time. So repeated error correction here is able, we would like to use repeated error correction in order to do deeper circuits. Here we're using it, you know, as a very simple test case. We're injecting coherent errors and finding that there's really important key physical mechanisms of repeated error correction that allows us to suppress errors. Uh, but now we really need to be able to reuse our atoms because otherwise we start to run out of our atoms really quickly as we're doing this entropy removal. And uh, in conventional atomic readout, there's a major challenge, which is that imaging your qubit states often mixes them together. And zero and one get intermixed. And so what we typically do is we convert one of the two spin states to loss. So we take qubit state one, and then we eject it from the tweezer. And now we just image whether the atom is there or not there, which is much easier for us to do, and we can do with a high fidelity. But the problem is that we get rid of now you know, a large fraction of our atoms. So what we would really like to be able to do is measure our ancillas without losing them in order to remove their entropy, but then still be able to use them in the computation. And so what we developed here is a way to do lossless state resolved readout, where instead of doing a spin to loss conversion, we do a spin to position conversion, which is heavily inspired by this beautiful um, uh, paper from Dave Weiss's group, where now we just, qubit state zero we put on the left, and qubit state one we put on the right. And the way we do this, as we, so we use optical tweezers, but we added a 1D lattice into our system. And this 1D lattice interacts with only one of the two spin states due to atomic selection rules. Uh, and uh, we then take tweezers, separate them. One of the two atoms is pinned in, by the lattice, and so it doesn't move, it stays in the original tweezer. The other qubit state moves with it. And then we take a picture of the positional state of the atoms. And this is what our data now looks like. And we're measuring Rabi oscillations here, not by destroying our atoms, uh, but by doing spin to position conversion. Note that this is not a coherent positional superposition. It's just a method of doing readout. But importantly, this is now non-destructive and also gives us the ability to detect loss. And so, okay, this ability to detect loss is extremely useful for doing error correction because it tells us, you know, about, you know, where a lot of our errors are. And I'll tell you about uh, at the IQIM seminar tomorrow, how we're using that to improve our error correction. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to start wrapping up. So um, this new readout technique is very useful for error correction. And it's, uh, oh, I took out a slide because I was asked to reconfigure my slides for um, the IQIM seminar tomorrow. But, but there's been really beautiful ideas here about erasure from Jeff Thompson and Shruti Puri and also incredible experiments from the superconducted Cuba community, uh, as well as Manuel's group, uh, that you know, are obviously heavily inspiring uh, this um, uh, technique. So, but so, okay, one aspect is it allows us to improve our error correction. Another aspect is we can now reuse our atoms and we don't have to rebuild our array every time we do quantum circuits. And so typically what we do is we initialize our atoms and then we do a single Rabi oscillation. And this greatly, you know, Im impacts how quickly we can collect data. Now we can repeat this Rabi oscillation a hundred times in a row before reinitializing our array. And this greatly improves our cycle rate. And okay, so we do this here by doing the Rabi oscillation. We then put the atoms back and then we repeat it again. And now this has allowed us to start exploring cycle rates, not of three hertz, but of you know, 100 plus hertz, which you know, greatly improves our quality of life so that we don't have to sit around so long averaging. Um, and uh, so that's one important aspect of doing deep computation. Another important aspect is keeping the array filled. And so here we have our array, holes get introduced into the array, but then we just replug it using a reservoir in the system. And then this keeps our target array at some you know, high filling fraction. Eventually it starts to go up though, because our reservoir starts to get empty. And so we're also exploring um, some initial experiments where we were reloading from an atomic cloud and trying to get atoms from a dipole trap in order to be able to continuously replenish our atoms for even longer. And uh, the, what uh, we're pretty excited about here is trying to explore deep quantum circuits where we're leveraging uh, you know, below threshold uh, entropy removal. And it's really like a big you know, thermodynamic cycle where you do some computation. The computation creates entropy. 
then you need to do stabilizer measurement to remove the entropy. But now the ancillas are at some higher entropy, so you need to measure them and you need to reinitialize them to remove their entropy. And it's all one big, you know, effective bridge. And we really need to, you know, maximize the bridge elements. So, okay, I'll start, um, Rebecca. Okay, so as some outlook about where we go from here. Uh, so, um, we have been working with, you know, physical qubits, like two level systems, since, you know, essentially the 1940s when we were studying NMR. And remarkably, pretty much all of them behave the same way, whether they're spins or superconductors or photons. And the reason they all behave the same way is they're all two level systems. This is actually very, very different now that we're starting to explore logical qubits. And these logical qubits are not a two level system, it's a unit of delocalized information. It's a many level, many level system, and it behaves in very surprising ways. Again, one of the key ones being that single qubit rotations are hard with logical qubits and entangling gates are easy. And I think we're really just barely, barely at the tip of the iceberg of understanding you know, practical operations with these error-corrected qubits. And I really view it as a new scientific frontier. And I think that by working with these in the near term, we're going to gain a lot of deep insight into the physics of quantum information. And it's also going to be able to enable um, uh, deep computation in the near term. Uh, and it's a pretty exciting frontier right now, both for neutral atoms, of which, you know, of course, is, you know, extremely exciting with elements here um, uh, at Caltech, uh, but also just, you know, also here at Caltech and also broadly throughout the field, there's been incredible recent quantum error correction progress. If you look at these archive identifiers, all of these papers are from the last month, and they're all really incredible quantum error correction papers. And I think it's quite amazing that in this year, quantum error correction is starting to take off so dramatically. And I think it's becoming extremely clear, like especially as of this year, that quantum error correction works. And I think this kind of leads to an inflection point in the field. And not only does this work, and it's very inspiring looking across all these different systems, but it's also really a remarkable exchange of ideas between all these different systems. And I think it's a very exciting scientific frontier. And um, OK, so something, however, the big elephant in the room that you know we have all these different systems and we're exploring you know, quantum uh, different different ways of manipulating them, and there's different ways that we're seeing that error correction is starting to work. But there's one central obstacle that we're nowhere even close uh, in any system, which is that we need to be able to control millions of qubits. And this is quite challenging. What I showed you earlier in the talk is we're controlling hundreds of qubits. And uh, so what we leveraged in today's talk is this parallelism on physical qubit level, where you have, you know, you want to do this operation on logical blocks, and we simplify the control problem by doing the same operation on all of the physical qubits of this logical block. But importantly, once you start to look at large-scale computation and you start to look at the algorithms that you might do, you find that all the logical qubits also all do, in many cases, do the same thing too. And those are also on a parallel, they're also here. And so you get parallelism on both the physical level and the logical level. And you find that really at all scales, at all hierarchies, all of the parts of your processor are supposed to do the same thing. And then the key question for us to ponder is if all the atoms are identical, and they're all supposed to realize the exact same operation using the exact same pulse of light, then there should not be any fundamental reason that we can't control millions of qubits. And this is something I think would be extremely exciting to explore as ways to getting toward large scale computation. But this is not only interesting for doing quantum error correction. This is one context where large scale parallel control can enable new scientific applications. But these particles are really pristine quantum objects. You know, Nick uses molecules, for example, very interesting fundamental physics. And atomic systems also are very interesting for things like clocks we have pristine quantum control over individual particles, over identical individual particles. And we can start to wonder what to use these for. And here, again, it's a very central concept, um, a, a very um, similar concept of parallel control, where all of these atoms sense the exact same signal. And I think it's very interesting to ask if by leveraging these ideas of parallel control, specifically for error correction and metrology, where we really need as many atoms as we can get, uh, can we design new architectures that would enable this? And I think that if we're able to do this, it would really enable new opportunities in error correction and in fundamental physics. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my talk. And I would like to thank my amazing collaborators. Thank you, Dylan, for a very interesting talk. We have time for some questions. If you're in the audience here, you can just raise your hand. If you're on Zoom, you can raise your virtual hand or put a chat message here yeah so you might have mentioned this maybe i missed it but where does the number of millions come from there's some simple estimate that says that that's what you need so that's a very good point and just like how with classical computers we don't say we need 
you know, one building fits, there's a continuum. I think that it is, it is, however, an interesting point where you can start to study a variety of large scale problems. The estimate that often goes in, although this is not the one that interests me, is something like factoring, because it's just such a clear and, and concrete problem. And the estimates of what we need is on the scale of millions of qubits in order to do that. Of course, we don't you know, need to do that per se, but something that you can really feel when you're doing these experiments in the lab is that now you know, we get start to get below this threshold and we start to be able to see that we can suppress errors. And the main obstacle is we just don't have enough atoms you know, in order to really be able to do simulations that are of interest to us. And okay, so maybe a, a nearer term thing is, can we make 100 logical qubits that operate with 10 to the minus 6 error in order to study, you know, something like, you know, some small scale, but very precise Fermi Hubbard system. And that, that I think can be sooner. Yeah. That estimate depends on physical error, assuming it's something like 10 to the minus 3 or a little bit. I agree. How much power do you need in the lasers for your uh, for your current experiment? And does it scale with the number of bits? And whose lasers are Who is laser? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so currently our highest power laser is a hundred watt 1013 laser that we use for entangling. And this is indeed a key bottleneck. And you know, 100 watts is the most that you can buy currently. We also are limited by our trapping laser power, which is at the scale of 10 watts at the wavelength that we use. And I do think that there's ways that we can increase these by probably a factor of 10. But I'm not so sure, to be completely honest, that we can increase them by factors of a thousand, at least not easily. And so I think that what's really prudent is for us to try to explore ways to control systems with way less laser power. I think that's, that is one thing that we should do in order to try to get to much larger systems. Yes? Yeah, can you comment on the, so what were the time scales for implementing uh, your logical gate operations? So if you were just say between cycles. Like yeah. transversal gates. Yeah. So we scale several hundred microseconds. And yeah. And you have this two second hyperfine. That's right. Mm -hmm. So do you have any ideas about how you could use, you know, combine the logic along with like some sort of quantum memory? Are you guys thinking about the lo logic along with memory? Could you give me more details? Well, imagine, you know, like in classical computation, we have mm. this sort of von Neumann architecture. Yeah, exactly. Memory and logic. Yeah. Do you guys have ideas about how to do similar things in the quantum domain? Sure. Yeah. So the, the, I mean, so, so I removed this slide, but we have this, you know, uh, we made these 40 small, error correcting qubits, you know, on 280 physical qubits by exactly using this von Neumann idea where we use the logical coherence time of the system and then we serially process on subsets. And serial processing is one way to increase the system size. It is a classic example of trading off resources between space and time. And so it's true that we can do that and then it does come at the increase of, you know, slow down computation. It also doesn't help us solve the problem of how do we hold on to all these atoms? Well, we're already limited by that. And, is that, and that's a limiter right now. That's, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And what's the time scale for that? How long you can have for the serialization? No, how long can you hold on to them before you start? Oh, out? we can hold on to them. I mean, like in principle, for you know many minutes. That's not really a challenge. I mean, more the laser power required for holding on to them is currently way too high, and that greatly impedes our ability to you know trap use that huge rates. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So um, for qubits in the paper, almost is written in I'm wondering, like, now sure if you mentioned, uh, I'm wondering if the uh, wiring for, for the uh, for the chips are also going to be configurable. Wiring for for which chips? Uh, to control the like the after control the layouts. Oh, like the physical hardware. Yeah. So I think it depends on. So that is a question, right? I think it's actually a it's a sci it's a science and engineering question. How do we leverage all this intrinsic structure in order to design architectures that can efficiently control very large systems. And I think that there could be many interesting ways to explore. And so, okay, yeah, classical hardware can be reconfigurable. The main thing that I think to get to really large scales, the main thing that we really heavily need to leverage is structure. Because once you start to look at large algorithms, you start to see that all these logical blocks do everything in parallel. And if they're all doing everything in parallel, if we could find ways to control those with way less laser power, then it's not so obvious it needs to be too hard. Or at least that's the hope. For, um, uh, you said like the, in the classical case, we also have reconfigurable architecture. Um, so, well, when you mentioned the large scale, uh, 
and also it in the future we do uh I mean uh, extremely large amount of qubits design. Um do you think the architecture design will be quite similar to the classical like VLSI layouts? Like on the quantum. Yeah. I think I think there could totally be similarities. I think it's an open question. I think so. Yeah. Are we going to like maybe change a little bit, but mostly direct and borrow from the classical VLSI designs to do that? It's not clear. So I mean, in this so in this work, so again, I didn't show, but we had our zoned processor, and the zoned processor, what it allowed us to do is, you know, for example, like this von Neumann ideas, and that was in a way that we simplified our control. And there's but there's interesting, you know, similarities and differences to classical computation. So, you know, one example is that, you know, and this is, I think, already highlighted here in classical computation, the bit is the unit that you operate on. It's this, you know, digital discretized building block that has very low error. And quantum computation is already a very key difference, which is that physical qubits are not the key thing you operate on. You operate on logical qubits. So already you can see there's a difference. You should be doing things in blocks. There's other, you know, really weird challenges with quantum computation. For example, you have to do this circuit sometimes, which we call the magic state distillation, and it produces a very specific type of resource state noiselessly. And it's, you know, there's many funny aspects of this, which is that it's actually much cheaper to make this state, for example, somewhere else, and then teleport it to you. You could have like a T-state factory in Texas, you know, and then you pay, yeah, you pay $10 to get this T-state. I mean, that doesn't happen with classical information, right? So if these quantum systems are very weird, right? So we should, ex I mean, people have worked so much on classical systems. We should absolutely be inspired by it. But I don't think at this moment in time, we should take the connections too, too seriously, if that makes sense. It's, it's, it's inspiration at the moment. Yeah. Maybe time for, let's say, two more questions. Alexi? Yeah. So, so here the syndrome measurement is extremely parallel. It's again another thing where you just have to do the exact same operation on the block. So, for example, here when we do our syndrome measurement. So here when we do our syndrome measurement, we have an ancilla grid interlaced with the with this um, data grid. And then we just do four parallel motions, so like right, left, up, down, in order to, and then with global pulses, in order to do the stabilizer measurement. So that's highly parallel. Also, if you had you know a thousand logical blocks and did them on all in parallel, it would also still be parallel. But it is slow. It takes several hundred microseconds per move. So it can take up to even a millisecond for stabilizer measurement. There's, yeah, maybe I can leave it there. Yeah, and that also takes on the scale of, I think, it, so clearly it's at the scale of millisecond, I think it's very realistic to do at the scale of several hundred microseconds with the existing architecture. That said, I think it's also very interesting to ask, can we design new architectures that we could do this maybe much faster? And I think that's, again, an open research question. Yeah. On this slide, I didn't quite follow um, this plot on the right. Yeah. What exactly is going wrong when you only do one QEC round that suddenly is fixed by doing two? Oh, oh yeah, it's kind of a peculiarity. There's kind of all there's kind of some funny like threshold like behaviors here. But zero, zero and one are very comparable. In zero, we don't do any stabilizer measurements. So it's just unentangled physical qubits, and of course they're sensitive to coherent error. When you do one stabilizer measurement. It helps you a little bit, but not much. It doesn't really help you so much to prepare the state. And it indicates that you know, you're, not, you're not benefiting just from making the state. You really need to do the stabilizer measurement to stabilize yourself. You know, it's like almost like you had a, it's almost, it's not quite this, it's very, very related, but it's almost like having like a, you know, a Hamiltonian you can apply and having some sort of topological gap that you know, protects you from you know, coherent imperfections. It's not exactly that, but it's very similar. So, so in one and zero, it, it just in this in particular implemented circuit, it's very similar. What about the fact that there's not much difference between two and four? So, like, what happens at five? Like, do you would you imagine? Can you see that? Does it saturate, or do you keep seeing improvement? Or it, so it intimately depends on the way we specifically do the circuit. So this here is you know kind of like a test case of injecting entropy. So in the way we specifically chose to do it here, this is just the way that the numbers worked out. I mean, in in practice, 
you know, you want to be in a regime where you ideally don't have much coherent error. The stabilizer measurement but does continue to project you into, uh, you know, uh, incoherent errors. And um, uh, you want to just optimize the number of rounds of error correction to keep the, you know, the rate of entropy you create and the rate of entropy you take out at some balance that you're happy with. So say you can be, for example, a factor of 10 below threshold, as John said. Um, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And is it hard to go beyond four in your system, at least the way you're implementing it here? Is that why? You... Yeah, so that's why I really like this plot because the, I mean, so we can do like 20 or 30 by just brute four, you know, just having more atoms. It doesn't really change the physics that we learn. Also here we're interested in, you know, a handful just because we're, you know, we're not really, this is not really a memory experiment. It's like, how well can we remove entropy? Now, now you really need to do this with gates interspersed. That's the thing that's really interesting. But the, the reason I, I like this is because it just, it's so striking. I mean, you see that the repeated correction prevents entropy from growing on your data qubits, but now the ancillas become useless. And you run out of ancillas very quickly. But and so, what, 100, you said? 100 rounds? Is that what? Yeah, well, that's the goal. Yeah, that's that's the goal. And that's, uh, that's I mean, so, so that's the whole point of uh, this and trying to do, you know, many, many repeated measurements of our atoms because quantum error correction intrinsically, for the reasons that we mentioned, has a lot of measurements. And it really is very wasteful to reinitialize your atoms every time. Uh, in order to do many, many repeated measurements. Excuse me. So yeah, but that's ongoing research. But but yeah, I mean, for this particular experiment, there's no real point of going beyond a handful. But now we would really like to you know leverage this and start doing you know deep algorithms where we do gates and then we're doing repeated correction, etc.